going to start off by sort of uh, taking you through what I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to tell it to you, and then at the end, I'm going to tell you what I've told you. Because many years ago, I was it was explained to me that that's a way of giving a good uh, address to people. So what we're going to do is we're going to think a little bit about the history of financial technology, and we're going to think about the application of that history to real-world problems. And then we're going to talk a little bit about what would you need to do in order to make technology work properly within the uh, parameters, if you like, uh, of, uh, uh, of those real-world problems. And then finally, I'm going to give you a little bit of a demonstration of that technology actually working. Now, Settle believes that STP stands for straight-through processing. Many of the blockchain companies you've seen also believe in STP. And STP for them, ladies and gentlemen, straight to PowerPoint, because they don't have the stuff to show you, they don't have the capacity to demonstrate those things you need to do. So what are the things that we could talk about to begin with is the history. So here's the history. About every decade, every 10 years or so, something big in financial services comes along. Something big in financial service processing, something big in financial services itself comes along, about every decade. In the 1970s, guess what? It was Swift. Swift was revolutionary once. In the 1980s, that was the decade when there was the dematerialization of stocks and bonds. All those pieces of paper migrated onto ledgers. All those pieces of paper became electronic records. They didn't talk to each other, but that didn't really matter because at least they were, they were on some form of ledger. In the 1990s, that was the decade, if you will, when central market infrastructure, things like CLS, things like some of the very big um, central market structures uh, 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 began to arise. And some of the RTGS systems at central banks, it came sort of standardized in that decade. In the first decade of the 21st century, ladies and gentlemen, that was the time which the application, if you will, of super fast technology to the front office space. That was the time when we saw algorithmic trading. That was the time when we saw high frequency trading. That was the time when we saw the capacity of stock exchanges and all the rest of it to really change. That's what we did with ChiX. And really, if you really look back at the day and what ChiX was all about, it was using 21st century technology to replace COBOL running mainframes, which were the trading engines of the majority of European stock exchanges in those days. 21st century technology to replace those COBOL running mainframes. Stay with that thought, if you will, for a moment. So then moving on, also uh, in that first decade of the 21st century, another really big change. In May 2000, a small company in Atlanta, Georgia was founded. In May 2000, less than 150 months later, Dick Grasso at the New York Stock Exchange, that was all gone, and ICE owned the New York Stock Exchange. 150 months. How so? Technology. Cheaper, faster, smarter. So, what did we do when we had a little think about what we believed was necessary? We thought that the idea of where are all the COBOL on mainframe applications still hiding, ladies and gentlemen, it's post-trade. It's the thing that occurs in the factory, on the foundry floor, in the chemical converters that banks are. That's where mainframes on COBOL are still dominant. Not all banks are that good, but uh, <laughs> many, 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 many uh, managed to achieve it. So we thought that the application of a blockchain solution in that space was going to be the right thing to do, because we feel we're on the right side of history. We've already done it once. We feel we can do it again. So we had to do some thinking, some real hard thought. And the real hard thought was, what are the characteristics that you need of a chain that is going to allow you to meet the needs of modern finance? So what are those characteristics? We say there are five. There are five characteristics that you need. Characteristic one is you've got to be able to operate, ladies and gentlemen, at financial market speed. 
Now, what does that mean? Does that mean the 30 transactions a second that Ethereum can do? I don't think so. Does that mean this sort of whatever the number Hyperledger is able to do? Again, I don't think so. You've got to be able to do tens of thousands of transactions a second if you're to be able to provide a service across the piece, different asset classes, different banks, different jurisdictions, different systems. Because you know what? If you don't, what, sort, what sorts of things start to happen? Well, it's really clear. Go back a few years now, but just go back to the time when the Swiss National Bank changed its price against the euro. Nine o'clock in the morning. There'd been about, I don't know, 50 or 60 euro Swissy transactions going through the markets at 8.59.59. And then at nine o'clock, when they announced that it had changed, that went up to three, four, five hundred thousand transactions. Get behind the tape there, as many people do, and guess what? The next thing you do, you're being handed your pink slip because it's all over. Because you don't have the records to know where you are. So a blockchain has got to be able to meet high performance, high speed activity. So we, we sat down and we said that's a real feature you've got to have. Tens of thousands of transactions a second. The next one is capacity. Capacity. A blockchain to be of any generalized use is not something that's going to be writing a block every seven minutes, a la Bitcoin or whatever it is today. It's got to be something that can write a block to, to be determined by the users of that chain. It's got to be able to do things that are up to, you know, a billion transactions a day. We've demonstrated a billion four. We can go up to any number you want because we've done engineering that will allow us to run these things in parallel. You don't run it in series, you run it in parallel. That's what makes it super fast. That's what makes it super uh, resilient in terms of its uh, capacity. So the third thing that we thought you had to do, you have to run this in a permissioned environment, because I don't believe regulators are happy with things that take place on, chain, or on, on nodes or things where they can't actually uh, get to and regulate and control and understand. So you have to do three further problems in that particular head. You have to solve KYC and AML as native. You can't add it on afterwards. That's important. Second, really important, is you've got to be able to do privacy. Because there are parts of a bank, there are parts of an operation, there's parts of an organization that need to see data. And there's other parts of that organization that need to process data but don't need to understand what it actually means. So, for example, you're going to let your traders see their trading positions, but you're not going to let your traders see the positions of the asset managers. Well, go speak to Corder about how they get around that problem, because I don't think they have. I don't think they have. So you've got to be able to do privacy. And the final thing you've got to be able to do is really quite important. Think about all, those, uh, all the, the buzzwords that we use in finance today. We, we talk about open architecture, and we talk about open source, and all the rest of it. Do I really want to put my code out into some sort of open source environment? No, of course I don't. Why not? Well, one, because I want to sell it, a la NASDAQ. I want to actually produce a return from it. But secondly, because you're moving real money, because you're moving real assets, you don't want to make sure, you want to make really certain that the bad people, and there are plenty of them, aren't sort of getting a a leg up into your code base, aren't beginning to understand your processes, aren't getting any intelligence about the actual way the system works that you don't want them to have. Because they'll spend a lot of time doing that. In the old days, the, you know, the, there was always that joke about why do, you, why do you rob banks? And the answer was, well, that's where the money was. And today, of course, it's uh, why do you interfere with systems? And the answer to that, of course, is that's where the money is. So you've got to be able to do those sorts of things. And the final piece of that sort of third head, if you will, is you've got to think about what are the coming challenges. What are the things that are actually, you know, we're all uh, very sophisticated, and we all know about elliptic curve cryptography, and we all know about the, the, the really difficult pieces of, uh, of maths that go on behind that. But what happens when you get quantum computers? What happens when you get Instead of being able to do 8 or 10 or 15 qubits, you get up to 80 or 100 or 500 qubits. What happens then? 
does public-private key cryptography just fall to pieces? Well, if you build a system on that and somebody gets a 500 qubit quantum computing system, maybe it is. So you need to be able to think about what the future is. You need to be able to put in place, baked into your code, alternative methods of encryption and alternative methods of taking the service forward. So the fourth thing that we thought about, the fourth piece of this equation for us, is you've got to use real world assets. That's pretty obvious to us. You don't want Bitcoin, you don't want XRP, you don't want Ether, you don't want any of these things. You want dollars, you want yen, euros, sterling, whatever it is. But you want those things because those are things that can go into your books and records in your bank. You want those things because those are things that you can show to your shareholders. Those are things that you can value and use and ultimately affect that thing which is essential for the whole process of banking, achieving settlement finality. And of course, achieving settlement finality for banks really only occurs when a transfer takes place across a central bank ledger. Until I see central banks accepting some of these cryptocurrencies, I don't think necessarily that we're going to get a particularly fertile furrow uh, out of that particular service. So the fourth thing is you've got to see real-world assets. Finally, simply, but we can all get there. We can all do this ourselves. Finally and simply, mobile phone networks, there isn't just one great big pan-galactic mobile phone network. No, I live in London. I have Vodafone. I can speak to my daughter who works here in the city. She's on an AT&T contract. I don't have a special code to dial in because it's an AT&T network being dialed from a Vodafone network. No, there is connectivity between those networks. That's very, very difficult for the majority of the so-called um, distributed ledger companies to admit that what they haven't solved is the so-called cross-chain problem. How do you move things from a chain to another chain, maintaining the cryptographic integrity of the first chain and not compromising the cryptographic hygiene of the second chain? Well, I'm really proud to say that back in November in London, we demonstrated that with Deloitte. We moved information from a chain run by Deloitte to a chain run by Settle at very high speed, very high capacity, and it powered uh, real-world purchases of real-world assets. In fact, what it powered was the purchase of uh, cupcakes, but uh, uh, it, uh, it could have powered <laughs> uh, for the purchase of many more things. The point being that the ability to talk between chains allows you to run those chains in parallel. And when you run those chains in parallel, guess what? That's when you get this huge capacity. So these are really important things. So we said when we sat down and did this, you know what? It's a great shame. There's been a lot of thinking that's gone on in lots of the Bitcoin, lots of the distributed ledger, lots of the blockchain stuff. But frankly, hardly any of it is actually going to be meaningful from the point of view of what you do with a real world financial application. And that's actually really important to us. So we want speed, we want capacity, we want to be able to do KYC. We typically want to use real-world assets, and we have to do those cross-chain communications. So moving on, trusting that the gods of technology will work, uh, I will attempt now to show you some of this stuff actually going through. And the gods of technology are being kind to us, it looks like. OK, so here we go. This is a settled chain, ladies and gentlemen. Really straightforward. We've got, at the moment, five real data centers with five real sets of servers in them. And we're pinging messages between those. And we chose them deliberately so you get a good geographical spread, so you get real-world latencies in the ping uh, messages that are moving around. Second of all, we're actually flooding, at the moment, transactions onto this at the rate that those transactions go through the Bank of England. So this is Bank of England data. 
This is a simulation. We obviously don't show real-world applications with our clients because that's their data and we don't use it. But this is Bank of England data. Uh, and effectively, we're looking there at around about, if you look up here, around about 34-ish million transactions a day. That's OK. That's about a third of the capacity of this particular chain. And I can add and add and add chains. Each chain's got about 100 million uh, transactions a, uh, uh, on it. So that's, uh, that's fine. Um, it's taking, at the moment, about 1.28 seconds to do all the pinging to check to test the following two questions. Question one, is the proposal cryptographically signed properly? And if the answer to that question is yes, the next question is, does the key that has originated this transaction have sufficient balance on it to be able to make that transaction happen? And if the answer to that, again, is yes, then it's put into the uh, block to be proposed. The, um, we use a voting mechanism uh, to, to, uh, to get to speed. And we can do that because we're running in a permissioned environment. So we've got a set of rules that are external to the system. Anybody that tells you code is law probably needs to have a bit of a good set, sit down with a law professor and have it understood and have it explained to them. There are things that we all use every day where code is law. And I think I can give everybody here, we're all sort of I'm looking around, we're all consenting adults. So I'll, I'll, I'm prepared to go into that space. OK? So it's, it's a calamitous Monday morning. There's things running around, there's small children running around, there's dogs, there's, it's a nightmare. You've come downstairs, you're late, you've got to get a flight, the phone hasn't charged, you know, just nightmare, right? You've got a big, big grab full of laundry, and you stick it in the machine. Oh, thank God, I've done that job. And you put the powder in, you push the button. A washing machine, ladies and gentlemen, in most cases these days, assuming it's not a top loader and you know, all those good, 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 good things, assuming it's a front loader, in most cases, a washing machine is a Turing complete system, which is to say, once you've started it, it can't stop. And I don't think there's a person in this room that hasn't done that and turned around, and there on the stairs is a single sock. <laughs> it's happened to everybody, right? Now, imagine what would happen in a financial system if it was all Turing complete. You need to have the capacity to stop things. You need to have the capacity to make changes. You need to have the capacity to explain those things external to the code. Why for? Because when things do stop, and they do, the history of finance teaches us anything, is that things do stop. When things do stop, what happens? Well, the compliance department get involved. After a little while, then maybe council get involved. After a little while after that, external council get involved. And ultimately, if you're really, really unfortunate, you go along and see a judge. Is there anybody in this room that actually will ever believe that a judge is going to sit there and look at a piece of JavaScript and say, go sub equals 9 is a completely valid uh, instruction and command within this data set? Of course not. Judges deal with pieces of paper and words on them. And that, we believe, really strongly, is the thing that will set out the, the future of finance in this particular thing. It'll still be super fast systems, but they'll be governed by and re reporting to, if you will, the legal agreements that set around them. So that's a, a, a very important feature. So we're, uh, we're doing things here. It's uh, just very boring. It's not particularly interesting. What do these transactions actually look like? Well, there you go. <laughs> the only thing you need to know about a blockchain, ladies and gentlemen, is up on that screen there. Really simple. You've got an issuer. That's how it gets there. You've got an instrument. That's what it is. And then you've got these gobbledygook alphanumeric keys. Key from, key to. Key from, key to. Key from, key to. That is the blockchain. It's functioning. It's acting. It's working. You've got a protocol. Those are the rules that that particular transaction was following. In some cases, you've got some 
CLS, you've got some chaps, you've got some, you know, it doesn't matter. Those are the rules, OK? So it's there functioning and doing stuff. So back on the big screen, we're writing blocks every five seconds. Could you write a block every second? Yeah, of course you could write a block every second if you wanted to. How would you determine that? That would be determined with reference to that document that I said at the beginning. Here, back on the big screen, um, we're flooding around about. It's, it's doing, at the moment, about 1,980, uh, 2,000 or so transactions per block. Uh, could you put that up to 5,000, 10,000, 100? Yes, you could put it up to whatever number you want. Those are things that are set by the parameters that you, as individual um, officers within banks or financial market infrastructure, uh, would choose to do. So that's it actually operating. It's really straightforward. It's all post-trade. None of this takes into account any trading. Trading systems are very efficient. You know, you can go and get a feed today that will give you all this information and just squirt it down. It's then, after the information has been squirted down, it then takes two days to actually get a whole load of financial market plumbers to move things around in order to make sure that the $100 or the whatever it is on one side against the stock on the other side has moved. It's absurd, right? It's absurd. Think about going into Starbucks and taking a view that you say, well, OK, I'd like a cup of coffee. And they've had a real problem. They've got to get the coffee there. They've got to get the water there. They've got to get the milk there. They've got to get the people there and all the rest of it. You go in there and you say, I'd like a cup of coffee. And they say, yes, sir, that would be great. Walk down to the other end of the counter. There's your coffee. You want to buy 100 shares of Starbucks? Well, <laughs> so that's, uh, that's fully electronic. That's going to take you two days. Nuts. Nuts. We can change that. We can change that together. So let's go and have a little look at some of that changing. So here we've got a very simple example. Uh, this is uh, some uh, stuff that's come down. We've, we've, we've said we've got uh, some Bank of England pounds, and we're going to take a, take a stock here. We'll take BP for an example. And just to show you that it's not canned, we'll just take a, a, a piece of uh, cash. We'll say it's 1,234 pounds against 100 shares of BP. Okay, so this is the contract between the two parties that was agreed not on our system. It was agreed on the floor of Bats Chayex in, in London or the London Stock Exchange or whoever else. Okay, we've taken the feed from them. This party wants to deliver stock. This party wants to deliver cash. That's all that's happened. So we've created that opportunity there. So on the one hand, you've got 1234 pounds is going to pay, be paid. 100 shares is going to be received. Equally, on the other hand, 100 shares is going to be delivered. And 1222 pounds is going to be received uh, in payment for it. Why 1222? Well, because in this system, just to show you, we've built in the tax man. What's a tax man do? Nothing except take the money. Doesn't have to do anything. He's not there to, to sort of look at anything. He just collects the dosh as it goes through. Well, you can put as many different people uh, in that system as you want. So this is important. The first part of this process is where the party commits. To, the first party commits to that transaction. How do they commit? They sign it with their public-private key pair that they're using for this particular transaction. They say, yep, that's a trade I recognize. Yes, I know that. That's quite straightforward and good. The second party comes along. Obviously, this happens electronically, so it happens effectively simultaneously, but uh, let's just show you the step through. The second party comes along. Actually, the second party doesn't come along, say. The second party the programmer or whoever else has gone to the bathroom. They're not ready to affirm this. So what you do, you go back to the rules that we said exist in that document at the beginning, and it says, well, if the second party doesn't turn up, what do you want to do? Well, let's say the rules say, well, five seconds later, you try again. Okay, you try it again. Still nothing. You say, well, try again. Five seconds after that, you try again. This time, something good's going to happen. This time, the person's come back from the bathroom and says, yeah, OK, yeah, I recognize that. I do it. Now, just to be really clear, I'll just take my spectacles off here, and I don't know whether you can see it. Maybe you can't. But um, the balance up at the top there is uh, 1,119,220 shares. That's going to go up to 320 shares. And the cash balances are going to change uh, accordingly as soon as this guy commits. So he commits, comes in, says, yeah, I recognize that transaction. 
That changes then from pending to completed, and those balances and those cash balances have all changed. Very straightforward. But let's say he didn't ever come back. What would then happen? Well, the chain could do something quite interesting. The chain can record that that party failed. And it would record it on the chain for all time, that that party on that transaction wasn't there to do it. So imagine how you're now going to price your business. You're going to say to your uh, people that want to come along and use your services, well, show me your fails. Show me how many times in the last six months of trading you failed. And the first ones would say, well, you know, 5,000 fails in 500,000 trades. You say, that's great. We'll give you great rates. The next one comes along and says, well, we did, uh, you know, 15,000 fails in, you know, 500,000 trades. They say, well, actually, you know what? Tell you what, <laughs> let's be a bit careful. We'll just, we'll add a few extra basis points to the charges for that because it's going to cost us money because you're, you're failing. You've got some better data points. The next one comes along and says, we'd really like to do business with you. So it was great. Show me your fails. 50,000 trades failed in 500,000 uh, transactions. You say, that's fantastic, sir. Ernst & Young are just along the hall. So that's good. But once you put things into straightforward boxes, once you start to understand things in simple ways, you get to the capacity to be able to do this with any assets. So here are some assets that are actually single currency between four banks. This is a netting chain. There you go. It's not surprising. As soon as this is committed, it changes to completed, and it's done. But do you need to just do it with a single asset? No, of course you don't. You can do it with multiple assets. So let's just do it with multiple assets. So we've got here, uh, we've got some euros, we've got some sterling, and we've got some dollars. So those multiple assets, we're going to commit to those. Each one of those is going to commit. And of course, as you would expect and imagine, as soon as you've done that, it completes, and we're all done. So that's great. That's really efficient. It's really simple. It's very straightforward. You've now got your feet up in the de on your desk, wondering whether you're going to go to East Quag for, for the weekend or maybe a little further out. Everything's really good. You're very happy. All of a sudden, the compliance officer comes running into your office, goes, oh, it's a catastrophe. Oh, it's a nightmare. We've had a really bad time. We did a trade, oh, I don't know, three weeks ago. Whoa. BP, we shouldn't have done it. You know, what's going on? Can you show me the record? And you say, yeah, sure, sure, sure. I'll show you the record. And you say, was it? That one. They say, yeah. Who signed it? When was it signed? How did it happen? How did it occur? But more importantly, ladies and gentlemen, you can pull up the exact state of the market at any particular time. So you want to go back 17 days, 4 hours, and 12 minutes ago, you can pull up that exact copy of everybody's balances, everybody's transactions, so you can see the whole thing. Now, imagine from the point of view of a regulator how powerful that is. Very, very helpful indeed. So we've got some good stuff here. We've got some cool stuff here. I want to leave you, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm going to be out of time in just about eight seconds. I want to leave you with the following thought. It's a very simple thought, but I think it's the way to think about this. I believe, seriously believe, that what blockchain will do to trading and finance is what the shipping container did to world trade. It's that simple. It will revolutionize the way in which we handle things. Today's dockers live on 6th Avenue in those canyon skyscrapers, doing the reconciliations and the processing and all the rest of it. They are nothing more than dockers. They are little more than telephone operators. Technology has, over the years, disintermediated that type of human function. I'm sad for the jobs, but I'm very pleased that I believe that this technology is able to make an improvement in our lives. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much.